Thank you. We turn now to portfolio questions. Uh, the member had to withdraw question number one, so we start with question number two, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action SEPA has taken to seek regulatory compliance for the sites affected by the cessation of medical waste services by Healthcare Environmental Services Limited. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Curran. And SEPA. Cabinet Secretaries. <laughs> SEPA has been closely monitoring and inspecting the HES sites in Dundee and Shots, including weekly inspections since December to ensure they comply with relevant environmental legislation. Enforcement notices were issued to HES in September and December 2018. However, further scrutiny has established that the company has not fully met the requirements of the notices. Subsequently, SEPA has commenced an investigation to establish if criminal offences have been committed. SEPA has also robustly reviewed the contingency arrangements in place at affected NHS sites to ensure all regulatory requirements are met and will continue to monitor all the affected sites to ensure the environment and local communities remain safeguarded. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for that reply. SEPA has indeed served four enforcement notices against HES, and we know the company continues not to comply with legal requirements and that criminal proceedings may well be necessary. But alongside the stockpiled waste, unanswered questions are mounting up. Can the Minister advise how many tonnes of waste has been stockpiled, the types of material, how long it's been piling up, and what is the estimated cost of achieving compliance? What is that likely to be? And in circumstances where HES will not or cannot return to compliance, will the Scottish Government recognise that NHS Scotland retains a legal duty of care for its healthcare waste and agree to fund the clean-up of stockpile waste left behind by HES? There's a, a number of questions there. But, uh, uh, there are a number of questions there, and some of them are not entirely uh, within my portfolio remit, and I'm sure the member realises that. And I will try to deal uh, with as much as I can. Um, the best available evidence suggests a backlog of somewhere between uh, 250 and 300 tonnes of clinical waste uh, on Scottish sites, and around uh, 10 tonnes of anatomical waste uh, mainly at Hassig Rig. Specialist providers advise that a specialist team will be needed to pack and load uh, that anatomical waste, and the loading uh, may take something like two days. Uh, a current estimate of the total clearance and disposal costs is, uh, is around £250,000, but I'm conscious that these are estimates, these are not uh, uh, um, fixed uh, figures, uh, um, and the uh, issue around cost, I mean, there is a contingency arrangement cost uh, as well as a clearance and disposal cost, which somewhat complicates the answer uh, to that question. Um, and contingency by its very nature does test, uh, tend to uh, cost, uh, cost more. Um, SEPA uh, continues to do robust uh, regulation and uh, monitoring, um, and it does have uh, potential future action that it can take. Uh, I've indicated that there is already uh, an investigation going on as to whether or not there are criminal uh, uh, um, uh, uh, activities that have taken place and I think we have to allow that to run its course. Alec Neal. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I, I ask the Cabinet Secretary, and I realise some of these, uh, of these two questions that may require her to come back and check before she can reply, but can I ask her, first of all, what the likely time scale is under these enforcement notices for the disposal of the waste in Scotland? And secondly, can she can advise if local, the local authorities concerned, North Lanarkshire Council and Dundee City Council, have powers under the Environmental Protection Act 1990 to remove the waste? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, compliance with regulatory standards is, of course, mandatory and uh, non-negotiable for whichever organisation is involved. Uh, I know that National Services Scotland is working hard to ensure all contingency measures uh, that can be taken uh, are being taken uh, and, and to ensure that that is taken forward uh, uh, sensibly and uh, properly. Uh, HES does remain currently responsible for meeting their environmental obligations uh, under their permits and that uh, includes the removal and treatment of waste from their sites but SEPA is monitoring that on a weekly basis and is continuing to seek uh, compliance from the operator. The, uh, the member has asked uh, um, perhaps slightly more technical questions and I, I think it would be advisable for me to uh, uh, go back to him uh, when there is a, a more detailed uh, potential response. Fulton McGregor. 
Thank you, President Officer. One of the affected sites that was reported in the as was reported in the press this week was a hill centre in Coatbridge. And understand what the Cabinet Secretary has said about SEPA's inspections and that they have not identified any current risk of pollution from the waste. But I wonder if she could outline what action, if any, could be taken by SEPA if such a risk was identified at a further stage. Uh, well, I did indicate earlier that SEPA does have uh, uh, continuing powers. Um, if there is a serious risk to the environment or human health, SEPA has powers within the Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland regulations, uh, which would allow action to be taken to deal with it. Uh, and in particular, Section 57 of those regulations allows SEPA uh, to arrange for steps to be taken to remove an imminent risk of serious pollution should such a risk be clearly identified. And those powers also allow it to recover from the operator any costs incurred in making the site safe. Question number three, Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government how it promotes responsible dog ownership. Uh, sorry, Minister Mary Gusha. The Scottish Government Code of Practice on the Welfare of Dogs, which was approved by the Scottish Parliament, provides dog owners with information on caring for and acquiring their pets. Now, a recent awareness campaign funded by the Scottish Government, and which was designed in partnership with the main uh, dog welfare charities, directed potential puppy buyers to detailed advice hosted by the Scottish SPCA. And as I said in the uh, Improving Animal Welfare statement that I made to Parliament last week, that actually... Uh, elicited a 130% increase in visits to the site and calls to the Scottish SPCA helpline. We also consulted last year uh, to inform the modern system of licensing and registration of dog, cat and rabbit breeding that we will introduce. John Arthur. I thank the Minister for that answer and I'd also like to uh, recognise the work of my colleague um, Emma Harper in this area with regard to livestock attack and also the work of my colleague Christine Graham who is undertaking to progress a Members Bill on responsible breeding and ownership for dogs. Yesterday the British Veterinary Association reported findings from their Voice of the Veterinary Profession survey suggesting that French Bulldogs and Pugs to quote top the list of dog breeds most commonly suspected of being imported illegally into the UK and I should declare an interest as an owner of two Pugs. Given the unscrupulous tactics employed by puppy smugglers, does the Minister agree that responsible dog ownership begins prior to purchase or adoption with researching the breed, establishing whether one has the time, space and resources to offer a lifelong home to the dog, and of only engaging with reputable breeders, and that this is especially important when considering the purchase of a popular breed such as pugs, which can be susceptible to particular health problems? Minister. They are, of course, one of my favourite breed of dogs. Uh, I happen to see lots of photos of Mr Arthur's pugs on Instagram, so I would encourage you all to follow that. But I would absolutely agree with, with what, the, what, what the member has just said. And I think the fact that... I think there are a number of people that care about issues in the, this area, and that's why we have so many members' bills that have, been, that have come to the area of animal welfare, from Emma Harper, Christine Graham, Jeremy Balfour uh, as well. But the Scottish Government has made general information on the purchase of puppies available to the public through its code of practice for the welfare of dogs, again, as I said, which was approved in the Scottish Parliament in 2010. And uh, again, as I mentioned last week, we had the, the awareness campaign that we ran between November and December last year. And given the success of that and the amount of people that then approached the Scottish SPCA website as a result of that, we are looking now at uh, doing another campaign later this year and really doing everything we can to, to tackle the, the scourge of uh, a, a legal puppy dealing and the the activities which can end up driving that trade and obviously we are looking at a number of measures as part of our licensing of dog cat and uh, uh, rabbit breeding the consultation as i mentioned that we had last year and there will be a number of measures within that which we hope will lead to lead to responsible uh, dog breeding and ownership uh, three more members wish to get in on this or two now uh, morris golden the Scottish Government recently confirmed the use of electric shock collars was still permitted. Can the Minister confirm when the use of these harmful devices will be effectively banned as promised? Minister. 
I, I know this is an issue that the member has raised on a number of occasions and I, I think I believe that there has been a, a drop-in session for other MSPs to attend today and it's something that members across the chamber have written to me about. It's been raised in the chamber a number of times and it was also something I met with the Kennel Club recently and they raised their concerns to me. But I would say that our position on that hasn't changed. We introduced the guidance to Parliament and that was agreed uh, by a number of people at the time and it was then agreed by the Environment Committee. And what I would say to the member is we are committed to reviewing that. We said we would review that guidance within 12 months and that's exactly what we'll do to see exactly how that has operated, has it changed behaviours and re-evaluate it at that time. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Dog fouling is a huge concern for my South West of Scotland constituents and community councils mm -hmm. across the South West region. That, and I've been exploring innovative ways of dealing with this nuisance problem. Can I ask the Minister if she's aware of projects such as Park Spark and Street Clean, which use anaerobic digesters for dog poo to power park and street lighting? And would she be willing to look at such projects and potential development? Minister. I thank the member for that question because I know that dog fouling is an issue and it's a scourge across all of our communities right across Scotland uh, and definitely something that, that is raised with me in my own constituency. Uh, but I also know that this is, as, as I said, an issue which affects many areas of Scotland. But it's, it's also a view that's shared by the Minister for Community Safety who actually has portfolio responsibility for this issue. And I believe that Emma Harper raised this issue with the Minister for Community Safety directly last year. Now, local authorities are responsible for tackling dog fouling in their communities and the decisions on how best to deal with that uh, are for local authorities to deal with. However, I'm always interested if there are innovative solutions that are being developed and how we tackle issues like that or issues that affect our natural environment. Of course, I'm interested in that and to hear more uh, because, of course, anaerobic digestion is an important part of our waste infrastructure for food waste and I don't see uh, any particular reason why other materials can't be used utilised in the same way. Polly McNeill. Presiding officer, this parliament I think should be commended for the importance that it has placed on animal welfare and that's been my experience. Uh, but like Maurice Golden, I believe the practice of electric shock collars should be banned. I want to know, is that the view of the minister? Minister. Thank you, and I know that this is an issue that the member also raised as part of my statement to the Parliament on improving animal welfare last week. And again, uh, I know the members and many others have, have written to me about this issue. But again, I would say that we had the guidance. We said that we would review it and we will fully evaluate it at that time. And that was within 12 months of that guidance being agreed. So I give the assurance to the member that that will happen. Question number four, Tavish Scott to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress towards its 90% carbon reduction target and how district heating schemes can help achieve this. Cabinet Secretary. Greenhouse gas emissions in Scotland have fallen by 49% since 1990 and we are on track to meet our current statutory targets. Uh, the member knows that there is also a bill uh, going through Parliament to increase those targets. Heat networks are one of the most cost-effective ways of reducing carbon emissions from heating as they're able to make use of large-scale and low-cost renewables and recovered heat sources. And the UK National Comprehensive Assessment of District Heating and Cooling estimates that 6.7% of Scotland's total heat demand in 2025 could be met by district heating and cooling. Now, Scott. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and the assessment she's made of, of that particular source uh, of heat. She's aware, of course, that there's a district heating scheme operating in Lerwick and has done since 1998. Uh, would she also recognise the importance of the SAP rating system allowing uh, ins and ensuring that energy efficiency standards can expand across the country and that currently the plans are to consult on that later this year? Would she therefore ensure that the government do look to uh, make sure that there are no barriers to the expansion of district heating schemes, given the advantages that she himself has, has herself pointed out this afternoon. I think uh, uh, all members of government would be able to uh, answer yes to that. And I know the member has been in uh, uh, um, discussion with uh, my colleague Kevin Stewart on uh, related issues. Uh, I should also say that uh, my colleague Paul Wheelhouse would be very anxious that I remind Tavish Scott about the commitment that he made uh, um, in November. Uh, to set out proposals to legislate uh, on regulatory and licensing arrangements for district heating uh, and to do so in the near future. So uh, I, I hope that the, the, the cross-portfolio nature of the response to this gives Tavish Scott some confidence that it is being seriously undertaken. 
Two further supplementaries. The first from Willie Coffey. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Is it not the case that the government has already set a clear pathway for heat decarbonisation in its climate change plan? plan? You can see it in Section 8 of the plan in the residential sector and elsewhere throughout the, the document. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, yes, we do set out clear pathways for decarbonising our heat supply. Um, our initial efforts are focusing, uh, um, I, I think, on uh, uh, reducing demand uh, for heat across the entire building stock and in replacing existing high carbon forms of heating in off gas areas uh, with lower carbon alternatives as well as developing heat networks where it makes sense to do so uh, and that's in line with expert advice from the committee uh, on climate change this is a this is one that we do have to go very carefully uh, with because uh, decarbonizing heat also brings into the discussion and conversation issues around fuel poverty that we've got to make sure we uh, understand uh, uh, and uh, members should be reminded uh, that the issue of decarbonising the gas network is one which remains reserved to Westminster uh, and of course gas at the moment provides uh, an enormous amount of uh, particularly domestic heating in Scotland. Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree that the Scottish Government should lead by example. Uh, so can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to encourage the First Minister uh, to publish an EPC rating for Butte House and not hide behind a statutory exemption? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I, I will uh, refer that to uh, the First Minister. I'm not entirely sure that it is in the First Minister's remit since Butte House is not owned by the Government. Um, so I will, I will have to ensure that uh, he has responded to appropriately. Question number five, Annie Wales. As the Scottish Government, in light of the findings of a recent survey by WWF Scotland, how it will support small businesses to prepare for the risk proposed by climate change? Cabinet Secretary. The Climate Ready Business Guide, published by mm. Adaptation Scotland, Scottish Enterprise and Visit Scotland last year, was sent to over 20,000 businesses and provides guidance for small and medium-sized enterprises including examples of businesses responding to climate uh, risks and opportunities uh, that continues to be uh, available. And last year, Adaptation Scotland sponsored the first Vibes Award for business adaptation. Annie Wills. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Last month, a survey by WWF revealed that five in six small, smaller firms in Scotland don't feel like their sector has direction from the Scottish Government about their role in tackling climate change with 60% saying they felt underprepared. Climate change poses severe risk to our economic stability, yet it's clear from this polling that Scotland's SMEs need more support and advice to ensure their businesses have a sustainable future. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what action will be taken to ensure these statistics improve and the majority of small businesses are prepared? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I am conscious that uh, uh, reaching SMEs uh, in respect of a range of, of issues can be difficult because uh, we are dealing with uh, often quite small businesses who are uh, not always able to spend the time that very large businesses can do uh, on some of these issues. Uh, so we do take it seriously. I'm aware of the, w the WWF uh, uh, research. I, I can advise the member that we do uh, uh, have a range of research projects underway to better understand climate risks for business and to inform future policy. Uh, so we are actually uh, trying to keep on top of this. Uh, but I, I do take on board the concern, particularly for the micro-businesses, uh, for their ability to access some of that. Uh, and I'm sure that the WWF uh, research has been of particular interest to those of my colleagues who deal uh, more often with very small businesses than I perhaps do. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And um, certainly the WWF report is very important and the Cabinet Secretary's answers um, bring some reassurance to SMEs, I'm sure. But I wonder if the Scottish Government has any plans to ensure that the Just Transition Commission might be guided uh, to engage with SMEs, rural and urban, to ensure its recommendations support them to take advantage of the net zero emissions economy, uh, including possibly developing manufacturing and remanufacturing. Cabinet uh, Well, the Just Transition Commission uh, is going to look at the issue of just transition in the broadest possible sense. And I think we've had some discussions uh, uh, already uh, about areas that might not have been automatically assumed to be part of that. I mean, I raised the issue of hill farmers uh, at the committee, and that is a just transition issue. Uh, managing very small businesses and micro-businesses in terms of the way they are able to cope uh, with uh, uh, progress to a decarbonised 
you know, uh, economy. That is also part of the just transition. Uh, I, I think it's important that we see that concept of just transition quite wide, uh, quite widely, uh, and the Just Transition Commission is well aware that that is something that we want to ensure takes place. James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, given the, the last supplementary, can the Cab Secretary confirm that an important consideration for the Government's Just Transition Commission is that no one should be left behind in our move to a carbon neutral economy? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, that is indeed the purpose of having the Just Transition Commission. Um, it, it is a discussion that is beginning to take place in a number of other countries. It, it's very, very important uh, that as we move to our carbon neutral economy, uh, that we do so in a way that is fair for all. Uh, and by all, I mean all, because there is a danger that we lose uh, and forget pockets of, uh, of, of uh, uh, the economy and all of this. Uh, obviously, yesterday we had a, a full afternoon's debate uh, on this, uh, and there was a clear consensus across Parliament uh, that no one should be left behind as we move to carbon neutrality. And I hope we can hold that consensus as we discuss just transition uh, in the years to come. We'll turn now from environment, climate change and land reform to rural economy. Question number one, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports initiatives that celebrate and promote locally sourced and produced food and drink. Minister Mary Goujon. The Scottish Government is committed to supporting the growth of local food throughout Scotland, including farmers markets, farm shops and other local food initiatives, because the sourcing of local food and drink helps not just strengthen the local economy, it's vital for our rural economy and the wider economy of Scotland as a whole. Now, last month we announced funding of £95,700 from the Regional Food Fund to 21 projects across Scotland that celebrate and promote local food and drink. That fund is still open for applications and I would encourage all members across the Parliament to promote that fund within their constituencies and to encourage many to apply. Jenny Gilruth. Thank the Minister for that response. Uh, I welcome the funding from the Regional Food Fund to the Food uh, from Fife Partnership, but of course all of the government's work to promote the Kingdom's fantastic food and drink sector is now threatened by the disruption of Brexit. Does the Minister share my concern about the catastrophic impact that a no-deal Brexit on businesses like the award-winning Balburnie House Hotel in Mark Inch, which has always employed 20% upwards of its staff from EU countries? Minister. I absolutely share that concern and I think Jenny Gilruth also raises an important point about the people from EU countries that currently live and work in Scotland. I actually attended a meeting yesterday with the Cabinet Secretary with representatives across the food and drink se sector who told us about just how vitally important EU citizens are across the board when it comes to food and drink. And especially within uh, my own portfolio remit, if we were to look at the vets and abattoirs, 98% uh, of the vets that work in our abattoirs are, uh, are EU citizens. And that's why I have to say, and just to be perfectly honest, I mean, I don't think I have the words to fully describe how absolutely outraged and disgusted I was last night to hear the Prime Minister, in response to her government's defeat, suggest that because of that defeat, there is now no clarity for EU citizens. Now, clarity is something that both she and her government could have given EU citizens at the very start of this process two years ago, like many other countries across the EU did for the British citizens living there. And this is the exact thing she refused to give because she was too busy playing to the hard right of her own party. And that's why I'm proud that this government has done all it can to reassure the EU citizens living across Scotland that we'll do everything within our power to help them. And it will be to the eternal shame of the UK government that they haven't seen fit to do the same. There are uh, four members wish to ask supplementaries in this question. Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much, President. Obviously, the Minister will be aware of the importance of Orkney beef and lamb, not just to the island's food and drink sector, but to Scotland's. She may also be aware of the damage that the loss of the local abattoir has had on, this high on these high-quality brands. Following the efforts of the Cabinet Secretary last year, for which I, I thank him, will the Scottish Government ministerial team re-engage with the local council, NFU, Orkney Mart and others to ensure that every possible option is explored in securing a long-term future for a local abattoir in Orkney? Minister. Oh, absolutely. And I know that that work is ongoing at the moment, too. And I would say that, I mean, mobile abattoirs 
abattoirs was raised, the issue of that was raised during the Improving Animal Welfare Statement last week too. And I know that there are projects being looked at and some that, are, that have been funded through risk funding, for example. So I know that this is something we are, the, the work on that is ongoing. And I'd be happy to meet with the member to discuss that further. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The member will be aware of the positive impact that East Ayrshire's uh, public food procurement policy is having on the rural economy uh, in East Ayrshire, not to mention the health of uh, our school children. I wonder what uh, the, the Minister of Conservative Scottish Government can do to encourage this kind of uh, uh, behaviour across the rest of Scotland. Minister. I absolutely I, I welcome that work that's ongoing and that's work that we're currently funding as well because I think that there are, I visited a project for example just before Christmas that had seen initiatives like that, that was just in the centre of Edinburgh and uh, so there is work ongoing to try and encourage that public procurement process. I visited a, a primary school for example which was all about locally sourcing and locally, locally produced food. So this is something that is very much a priority for us and something and work that we hope to continue. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. If Scotland's food and drink sector is to reach its potential, it needs to be supported by ambitious, comprehensive legislation. Over the past year, the government have, at various points, proposed a Good Food Nations Bill, a Food and Farming Bill, and a Scottish Agriculture Bill. Can the Minister tell us which one it will be, and can she confirm whether this legislation will introduce a statutory right to food to help put an end to the scandal of food poverty? Minister. I would just to respond to the member that we are considering all options in that regard and that there will be a consultation on that. And Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. I share my colleague Jenny Gorrow's concerns that the increasing likelihood of us crashing out of the EU on the 29th of March. Would the Minister agree with me that the absence of a trade agreement between the UK and European Union will not only cause untold damage to food and drink businesses, such as McDuff shellfish in my constituency, but also to the wider local economy and the prospects of future generations that rely on the industry? Minister. Uh, absolutely. And I think that uh, nothing could probably illustrate the damage that not having that in place. And if we're in a no-deal situation, then a, a letter that was jointly signed by Scotland Food and Drink, NFU Scotland, Quality Meat Scotland, Food and Drink Federation Scotland, the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation, Scottish Bakers and Scottish Agricultural Organisation Society. Uh, they said that they estimate the cost of no-deal to our industry would be at least £2 billion in lost sales annually. That's on top of the short-term chaos resulting from transport delays and labour shortages. Our businesses are all already bearing the cost of no deal, having to spend millions of pounds in time and investment to mitigate the potential disruption. So uh, there uh, is absolutely no doubt that if we're in that situation where there is a no deal, that would be absolutely catastrophic for Scotland. As well as the meeting that I talked about, I referred to in an earlier answer, where we met with some of these organisations, uh, the Cabinet Secretary and myself also attended a meeting with, the, with Michael Gove in London on Monday, where the Cabinet Secretary outlined that we need to remove, and the, the UK government government needs to remove no deal as an option because it would be absolutely catastrophic for Scotland in particular but across the rest of the UK. So I think the UK government need to stop blackmailing us with that as an option and firmly remove it from the table so it is no longer an option and actually work to do something that will work uh, for the, the hugely important food and, drink food and drink sector in this country. Question number two, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will engage stakeholders and the public with the Good Food Nation consultation. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, publication of the consultation on Good Food Nation proposals for legislation on 21st December represents an important step forward in the move towards Scotland becoming a Good Food Nation. The Scottish Government has invited over 300 stakeholders and interested parties to respond to the consultation. Publication was accompanied by social media coverage announcing the consultation and social media will also be used to highlight the approaching closing date and to encourage responses. Ross Greer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Food Coalition in preparing their report last year engaged over 800 people in 160 conversations to hear what living in a good food nation meant to them. The top two concerns were the affordability of a healthy diet and the environmental impact of our food. There's clearly a strong desire for public engagement, but the Open Government Action Plan stated that there's a growing mistrust of both the process and the outcomes of consultations in Scotland. In planning and designing the Good Food Nation consultation, could the Cabinet Secretary confirm how the Scottish Government has taken these concerns into account and met its commitments to open government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, be because we uh, welcome the responses to our consultation, we have encouraged over 300 stakeholders and interested parties to respond. 
Uh, I would use this opportunity to seek responses from members and perhaps political parties in this chamber. Uh, and uh, we take responses to these consultations extremely seriously. Uh, uh, they are open, they are transparent, they are free for people to contribute towards and I very much hope and expect that the contributions received will be considered with due care. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We all know that the main priority for people in food poverty is to feed their family and not fill in consultation forms. That becomes a secondary concern for them. Yet for the Good Food Nation consultation, more than most, we need to get the views of, and thoughts of those people who are using food banks. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he'll work with food banks to engage those who suffer food poverty and facilitate their response to the consultation? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's a very fair point, and uh, I'm pleased to advise the member that I already am uh, engaging therewith. I met with the Trussell Trust Chief Executive just a few weeks ago. I visited uh, very recently a food bank in Nairn in my constituency. It's a, it's a sobering and humiliating experience for people to have to go to those lengths. And very often I was advised, both in Nairn and by the Trussell Trust, that uh, people leave it until after they've been more or less starving for several days because it takes, a, it takes that, that desperation to force them to go and sub subject themselves to that degree of humiliation. So I think the member makes a very good point. I would indicate, however, that we are increasing the Fair Food bu Fund budget from 1.5 to 3.5 million in 2019-2020, thanks to the Finance Secretary, to enable us to continue to do our work to promote food delivery models that embrace dignified food proposals. And our whole approach, and I hope the member agrees with this, is chalk and cheese different from the austerity approach of the UK government, which so lets people down that are in food poverty in this country. Question number three, Alex Rowley. To us, the Scottish Government, what plans it has for the single farm payment scheme post-Brexit. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has set out uh, clear plans in relation to farm payments after exit from the EU. I commend this document uh, to Mr Rowley, uh, Stability and Simplicity. I think this is the fifth time I've brandished it in this uh, uh, chamber, and rightly so. Uh, we'll implement uh, our proposals, which cover payments up to 2024. And as in the motion uh, agreed by everybody except the Tories in last week's, uh, I believe, in last week's uh, parliamentary debate and rural support, we will set up a group consisting of producer, consumer and environmental organisations to inform and recommend a new bespoke long-term policy for farming and food production for Scotland. Alec Bradley. The, the Cabinet Secretary for that response and, and, and I look forward to him sending me that document. I think farmers are concerned about what's going to happen post-Brexit, but can he tell me when does the Scottish Government intend to introduce its agricultural bill? And he specifically mentioned the, um, the group consisting of producer, consumer and environmental organisations. When does the Scottish Government intend to convene this group? What will be the process for appointing these organisations and what will be the role once appointed? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, there's several questions there. First of all, um, Mr. Riley refers to farmers' responses. Farmers did respond to this, this document last year in, in large numbers. Uh, the responses overall were supportive of our approach. Our approach is to provide stability and certainty in the face of the Brexit uncertainty, which Mr. Riley rightly refers to. And these proposals in this document, presiding officer, are in fact the most comprehensive uh, set of proposals uh, in the UK. They will last for a period of five years. Uh, for Scotland and that certainty and stability welcomed by farmers uh, is something uh, that I believe is a very positive step forward in helping the farming sector. The member asked about what we will do about setting up the stakeholder group. Uh, the proposal came from Mr Rumbles. I was happy to agree to it. Uh, I, I'm looking at Mr Rennie and it wasn't Mr Rennie, it was Mr Rumbles. Uh, uh, and the, just, just last Thursday, we agreed to that. Uh, so obviously, we are in the early stages of looking at answering those questions, but I intend to make rapid progress, uh, as rapid progress as I can, to bring forward a, a, a distinguished group representing all relevant uh, stakeholder interests in accordance with Parliament's wishes, as passed by a substantial majority 
except, of course, the Tories last week. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what guarantees have been put in place to ensure funding for forestry, woodland creation and tree planting in the future? Cabinet Secretary. Well, funding uh, in forestry is provided by the Scottish Government in partnership with the EU. Uh, we have come to rely on that EU funding, which is vital for the continuing success of forestry. On Monday of this week, I sought from Michael Gove better assurances about the future of forestry, and I did so following the submission to Mr. Gove of a letter by CONFOR in Scotland. In that letter, they pointed out that uh, whereas some assurances have been received for funding for farmers until 2022, funding for, for forestry uh, is subject only to assurances which uh, apply to funding for contracts entered into up to 2020. So not unreasonably they say, well, can we have assurances for the same length as farmers? Now, I asked Mr. Gove that question. I, it came from industry. I thought it was a very reasonable question. I pointed out that forestry is a long-term uh, venture. It takes three years, for example, three years ahead that nurseries plan and 18 months for an average substantial woodland proposal. The lack of assurances is already impairing investment in forestry in Scotland. But despite that, Mr. Gove completely failed even to recognize there is a problem. This is completely unacceptable uh, from Mr. Gove. I deeply regret it. Uh, uh, but we will continue to persevere. And I hope that all colleagues, including even the Conservatives, uh, will support the efforts to ensure that there's proper, structured, guaranteed, long-term, clear funding for forestry, which is, of course, a long-term uh, sector. Question four has been withdrawn. Question five, Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to Scottish Environment Link's 10 principles for future land management support in Scotland. Uh, the Scottish Government welcomes Scottish Environment Link's 10 principles for future land management support in Scotland. Uh, the proposals broadly reflect uh, what other stakeholders and the agricultural champions, the National Council of Rural Advisors and the CAP Greening Group have already recommended, and also the key principles set out in the motion agreed in last week's parliamentary debate on future rural support. The link pr principles will be considered more fully as part of the wider process for future policy. And I particularly welcome the call for accountability on definable outcomes. And that's why I've already signaled my intention to put a cap on the level of uh, maximum payments in future. Mark Russell. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? And I welcome the plans for stakeholder engagement that were discussed and announced last week. However, since 2016, the Cabinet Secretary has convened no less than five stakeholder groups to advise on food and farming policy. And in the most part, these groups have met behind closed doors, worked on short-term remits, and reported only to the Cabinet Secretary, not to Parliament. How will the Cabinet Secretary ensure this new group is transparent and that the Parliament and the wider public can be involved in its work? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I, I think the public can, can, also can be involved at any time in, in writing to myself, to other MSPs, and of course their representations are quite properly considered. They can also contribute to the work of uh, these groups by making their views known. Uh, the groups have published their reports. They have been made available to the public. So uh, I'm afraid I don't really accept the, the principle that in somehow this work has been other than welcome, positive, uh, and a constructive contribution to the debate overall. I think I'm right in saying, although Mr. Ruskell will no doubt correct me if I'm wrong, that actually last week the Greens did support the proposal to set up this group but I, I hope that support is still forthcoming. Donald Cameron. Thank you. Can I refer to farming in my register of interest? Uh, Scottish Environment Link also calls for opportunities for young people to work and manage the land, and they hope that new entrants to traditional sectors are encouraged and supported. How can the government realistically achieve this when it has decided to close its new entrance capital grant scheme and then fail to replace it? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I was proud that we had in Scotland, uh, and uh, this contrasts with other parts of the UK, very substantial support for new entrants, uh, and that helped a great many new entrants into farming. <coughs> support that wasn't available in other parts of the UK, something Mr Cameron and his colleagues never mentioned. There is, of course, still continuing 
the uh, farming opportunities for new entrants initiative that Henry Graham is developing with our full support. Uh, and that too is helping uh, new entrants uh, into farming. And the stability and simplicity paper, this one here, presiding officer, it sets out very clear proposals as to the desirability of looking to develop new proposals which will help further uh, new entrants into Scottish farming. Thank you very much. And that concludes portfolio questions. We're going to move on shortly to uh, the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 15390 in the name of Richard Leonard on Scotland's future economy. We'll just take a few seconds for ministers and the members to change seats.